those who represent the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago and the Point Lisas Industrial Development Company, otherwise known, intimately known as Plipdeco, as I invite each of you to introduce yourselves for the benefit of the record and those who are listening and viewing this hearing. And I would like to start on my right, and you can work through the line. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the chairman and members of the committee. I'm Ashley Taylor, president of Plibdeco. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. I am Cathy Ann Matthews, Acting Comptroller of Customs. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Shirley Ann Shepard, Senior State Counsel of Customs and Excise Division. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Kelvin Birch, Estate Security Superintendent. Port Authority. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. I am Jarrell Trouble, Manager HSSE of Plebdeco. Chairman and members of the committee. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Ricardo Gonzalez, CEO Acting, Port of Port of Spain, Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Chairman of this committee, and I'll ask my colleagues, members of this committee, to introduce themselves. Good afternoon, all. Thank you for coming. I'm Gerald Ramdin, Opposition Senator. Robert Lehunt, member. Paul Richards, Vice Chair, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Nigel DeFritas, member. Good afternoon and welcome, Nicole Olivia, member. Thank you very much. My time inform us that the objectives of this hearing as part of this committee's ongoing inquiry into the prevalence of firearms on the streets of Trinidad and Tobago, we, this committee, established the following objective. Hmm? For this hearing, it is to identify the ways in which the work of the various agencies involved in law enforcement can be enhanced in order to achieve the objective of the elimination of illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago. Might I indicate that today's hearing is really more specifically to get from you an update on the status of the cargo container scanners currently in the possession of the Customs and Excise Division at the country's legal ports of entry and other related matters. The Port, of, the port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago has its responsibility for the Port of Port of Spain, among other things, and of course, Plebdeco responsibility for that major port in that part of this island. I might remind you that all questions and or responses must, for the sake of good order, Initiative. be directed 
through the chair. I would like to remind those of us who have them that you either deactivate your mobile units or at the very least put them on silent so that they would not become a bother to you and possibly to others. I have noticed from your introductions that you have already acquired the very firm technique of using the communicative instrument in front of you and you depress the bottom right when you are about to speak, depress it again to make sure that the red light comes off when you are through to permit someone else so to do. Let me begin by rendering a small histography of how we got to today. Every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, and in some cases visitors, and even those who never visit these shores, reading about Trinidad and Tobago, would have easily learned about some of the challenges this country is having with the sordid business of crime in today's world. The police, the organization under law that is responsible for treating with, preventing, solving, prosecuting, for the most part, crimes in this country have indicated, among other things, that the use of firearms play a very significant role in the perpetration of those crimes. And therefore, they find it necessary to seize confiscate and prosecute persons who are not authorized to carry firearms in Trinidad and Tobago from time to time. And as we would all know, this is an ongoing work. The police would report from time to time that our borders are porous, to use a well-known term. They would have identified that there are some 26 legal ports of entry in this country and there are many others that are entry ports but are not legal in the sense of recognized by the state and regulated as such. The bottom line is, being the island state that we are, so close to the South American continent, given that we have been identified for many years now as a major transshipment point for drugs, and guns follow them, and guns stay in following them, we have a serious problem. This committee, mandated by the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, to look into issues touching and concerning national security and its implications, we embarked on this inquiry. That inquiry took us to a visit to the port of Point Lisas, the Deco's port, as well as the port of Port of Spain, as well as the airport, Trinidad. You didn't go to Tobago, not yes, yes, Piaco Airport. And um, we had an opportunity to see how the system works, and we saw in that some of the strengths and some of the vulnerabilities. One of the issues that arose rather poignantly in the course of that, those visits and this inquiry was the need for the imposition, implementation of technology to attempt and to resolve this problem. That technology included scanner systems where containers, shipping containers, and of course barrels through which a lot of stuff come for the use of citizens and leave. There are in this world scanning systems recognizing that it is now impossible to physically search all of these containers and barrels and whichever forms else they are moved 
by, it's impossible to search them by hand. So technologies have been introduced. And Trinidad is no less than the trees and the stars. So we are aware that scanner systems have been obtained by the government and have been made available for imposition, implementation by the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, and of course at Plibdeco. So I think I've given a fairly accurate synopsis, histography of the circumstances that bring us here today, as we seek from you some kind of update as to where we are at since our last interface. Because the problem, the mischief that we are addressing in this inquiry remains as it was then, if not morphing into something bigger and more challenging for us all. So I would like to begin by asking the Comptroller of Customs, Madam, before I do that, let me extend on behalf of this committee an apology to you all because we had scheduled this meeting for some time in the recent past. And since our scheduling it, the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago organized a sitting, yeah, the Senate sitting, at the precise time that we had scheduled for this meeting, and that had to be given priority, and our standing orders simply do not permit both to transpire at the same time. As a consequence, it would have yielded some measure of inconvenience to us, and more importantly to you. We would like to extend an apology to you, and we would like as well to thank you for your resilience, your having survived the trauma that it might have caused, and to have had you here again today. So I would like to begin this inquiry by asking you, Madam Chair, Madam Comptroller, to, for the benefit of the citizens of this country, explain in brief what is the relationship between the customs division and the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, and as well the Port Authority of, at Plebdeco, in relation to the use of these scanners. Thank you very much. Good afternoon again, everyone. And thank you for the apology, Chair. The Port of Port of Spain and Point Lisas, they are stakeholders and they are the conduits through which imports come into the country and exports, export of goods. They are the custodians of cow. Um, the role, what in those terms are gen is generally the role of the customs as it relates to those ports? At the border, we are responsible for examining containers, imports, exports of goods for securing borders and to ensure that goods are released at, within a timely manner to the citizenry and to importers. More particularly, the scanners of which I spoke, because when we visited the port at Port of Spain, we would have seen <coughs> tangible evidence of attempts to place and to get these scanners in place for their operation. What is the role of the customs in respect of the scanning operation? Okay, with respect to the mobile scanners, Yes. The Customs and Excise Division. Yes. These scanners were supplied to us by the U.S. Customs to the Ministry, to the Government of Trinidad and Tobago, and by extension, the Customs and Excise Division. And we are responsible for <coughs> non-intrusive inspection with the use of these scanners. With respect to the fixed scanner, I believe that is the responsibility, well, responsibility might be a strong word, of the Ministry of Works, but it's under direct control of the Ministry of Works. We, as customs, we will be trained to do inspections, non-intrusive inspections with these mobile scan, with these fixed scanners. All right. Thank you very much. Um, 
I think it would be proper for me to start with Mr. Ashley Taylor, the president of PlipDeco. Um, you would have heard um, the controller speak of two types of scanners, fixed scanners and mobile scanners. Are these in place and operation, in operation at your port? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, just to give you an, an update. Yes, thank you. So the, the, the two scanners that were destined for Plipdeco, those scanners were officially commissioned on April 18th of this year and subsequently placed into operation on the 20th of April, two days later. Since that time, approximately 546 containers have been scanned um, as of as of Friday last, um, which is approximating now approximately 18 containers per day. So initially when it started the first month um, in April, we'd have been doing four containers per day. It went up to 12 containers per day. Now approximately 18 containers per day are currently being scanned. Let me ask a quick one before I open the floor to my colleagues. Roughly how many <coughs> scanners, how many containers pass through per day? You said 18 now are being screened per day. How many pass through per day, from your knowledge? Overall, we, we, we handle approximately 140 containers on a daily basis. Per day? Yes. Uh, you would agree with me that 18 is a rather um, puny figure in the face of 140. What would you um, say accounts for that? Right, so again, our, our role at Deco is simply from a facilitation perspective. Customs uh, is the entity that determines which containers are, are scanned, which containers are referred to the cells, which containers are searched. And, I, and uh, from my knowledge, they would um, determine that based on the individual risk assessments that will be done. Oh, I see. Right. So we have our, our role simply is yes. to facilitate the process. Good. So you would scan or cause to be scanned on the direction of the customs? Well, we, we only provide the, the facility. So customs, so customs, so, so basically what, what um, prior to implementation, we would have had several discussions, several meetings with customs. Yes. And following on from that, we would have made the appropriate... Continue. I right. assure you it is not a fire alarm, okay. please. <laughs> right. And from that, from, from those discussions, we would have put in place the appropriate infrastructure, including the, the containerized offices for customs, the waiting area for the... the we the, do, Mr. Taylor, easily understand that. What right. I was getting at, uh -huh. the 18 per day that you are running at now, right. screening, I'm simply asking whether you comply with the direction of customs to screen those, or in other words, you will screen as you are directed by customs? Well, we, we, we will facilitate the process. So customs would basically, would basically advise through our Navis terminal operating system whether the container is referred for scanning or, or not. If, oh, it's, if, it, if it's referred for, for scanning, the truck driver with the, with the container simply the, is simply directed by our security personnel yeah. to the scanning area. Yeah. And, from, and from then on, the customs personnel will and take over. I have over. one question before I really open the floor to my colleagues who will have questions as well. From your vast knowledge of managing your port and on the basis of your observation of other modern ports around this world, best practice, so to speak, um, is that the way it's done, or is it that they are all, t as far as the technology allows, routinely scanned? Well, as far as my, my understanding goes, at, at other, other locations, there would not be a 100% scanning of all containers. What sort of percentage you know from your so, knowledge? Well, it depends, it depends on, the, on the, the country. So, for example... In the USA, yes. so you can imagine there are millions of containers passing through yes. on a daily basis. Yes. So the figures that I have, I have, I have seen, approximate about two to three percent of containers that pass through the ports. All right, members, you've heard so far. Uh, I would, Mr. Defreitas. 
Good afternoon again. Hello. I, I just want to ask, what is the average time for scanning a con one container? The average time taken currently is about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And, and that, and that um, basically consists of the actual scanning process, <laughs> as well as customs making a determination as to the, the, the contents of the cargo and, as, and, and whether they, and, the, and the container should be referred for food. And that's um, intrusive scanning? That's, if you've, that's, the, that's a non-intrusive. That's not intrusive, 10 minutes. So with intrusive scanning, how long would it take? Well, with intrusive scanning, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that intrusive basically means that, they will, uh, that a full inspection will be done. And in that case, the, cost, the container would be referred to the container examination station, open it up whereby the container would be opened and the contents would be taken out and examined. And that process would typically take an excess of an hour and a half. Okay, and um, this question is to customs. What criteria would be used for selecting a container to be scanned? Or that's one. The second question: Don't you feel it'd be better if it is that you scan containers first and then send them to be inspected or opened and inspected if something comes up at that point? Thank you, Chair. We have we use a risk management program intelligence special ops and random selection to determine which containers are to be used for scanning. Now, you would recall that this is a pilot. It was established on the 18th. We are still in the process with all the stakeholders, after which the pilot is for three months. As of the 18th of July, the pilot will be completed all the issues and problems that would have arisen would be taken into consideration. What else I would like to state here is that training in the use of the scanners, we have just 10 people trained at the moment. Five have been earmarked for Port of Spain. There are five at Point Lisa's. We have reached out to the providers of the scanners leaders, we have made arrangements to have them come in and train. We are trying to get 20 people trained. It is extremely costly, but that is where we are now. And to scan all the containers, one of the issues that was brought forward is the availability of the importers' trucks to come, because remember, the Equipment that is used to carry the containers is not owned either by customs or the port. It is owned by the truckers. And it is when they come to clear their containers that is when it is scanned. Member Oliver. Thank you. Um, I just want to direct some questions at Plib Deco. First of all, let me congratulate you for the speed with which you have um, taken on this challenge of implementing the scanning. And from what you have submitted, I see that before you started implementing the scanners, you would have had an average of 19 containers per day referred to CES. Post-implementation, that number has not changed. So that seems to me as though the implementation of the scanners has not had any adverse impact on your normal operations. Is that correct? Well, if, if you, if you um, would note that prior to, to implementation of the scanners, yes, we will send you um, 19 containers per day been sent to the container examination station. But in addition to that, we are now doing approximately 18 um, containers that are currently being scanned as well. So that's, that is in addition to the ones that have been sent to the container examination station. So it's really a twofold thing. Some are, some are currently being sent to the container examination station, and some are also being scanned at the scanning area. So with the implementation of the scanners, we have certainly a greater um, examination whether intrusive or none, of containers at your port. From what, I have, from what we have seen thus far, yes. So I'd certainly congratulate you with that, because that would give us certainly greater assurance that more of the PUs passing through your port would have been examined. Now, I noted that you made reference to the Radiation Safety Committee. Uh, so I guess the um, Comptroller could correct me if I'm wrong, but this... Um, committee was recommended to be established as part of the standard operating procedures that would have been developed 
by Customs and Excise Division. Um, I didn't seem convinced that the committee has yet been established. Has that committee been established? The, the, the committee has not, has not formally convened. However, meetings would have been held with the, the various stakeholders. As the, the, the Comptroller would, would, have, would have stated, the intention was that after the, after the three-month period, there would be an, assess, we have an assessment of how the system has been, been working, and that would, would also include a formal convening of the various members of the Radiation Safety Committee. Okay, um, may I ask if all the stipulated uh, members that are to be included in the committee, have they been on board in these informal meetings during this trial period? So the, the various stakeholders would have been met, would have, would have met with them individually to advise them of the, the intention to commence scanning. They would have, they would have been advised of the, the, the procedures to be employed before commencement, and they have all been on board. Well, just to clarify for members of the public, so the committee is supposed to include a radiation protection officer from the Ministry of Health as the chair. Do we have that person on board? Yes, we do. Senior customs officials, uh, port officials, a representative from the SWWTU is present. Right. So, as, as I said, the, the, the committee has not formally met us yet. However, we would have met with the representatives of the, the majority union, the SWWTU, to basically inform them of the intention to commence. We would have run through the procedures with them, and the necessary buy-in would have been obtained. What about the PSA? I believe the PSA, the discussions with the PSA would have, would have been held with the true customs and excise. Okay, one more question. You know that the hours, hours of operation at the scanners are 8 to 4, Monday to Friday. Now, outside of those hours, if, um, what happens if a container should be flagged for it to be scanned? Would it then be placed on hold until the um, Monday to Friday working period? So as, they, the, as the controller had, had highlighted, we are currently in the pilot phase, hence the reason why it's only been done Monday to Friday between the hours of 8 and 4. Once I, my assumption is, understanding is, once the pilot phase has been com completed then the, and the assessment, the assessment done, then the, the, the scanning of the containers will be done during the, the periods consistent with the, the gate operations at the port which is from 7, 7 in the morning to 10 at night. Just have one final question. I guess this will be directed to the controller. In selecting the containers that are referred to the scanning, how, who does that selection? A member of the Customs and Excise. A senior member from the Enforcement Branch. And in terms of your examination philosophy then, what percentage of containers do you aim to subject to either scanning or full um, examination? Best practice in most places indicate 40%. But as of the last hearing, we try to up the ante and uh, we try to examine as much as we can so we are trying to examine about 50%, but it is extremely difficult. You said you try, but what have you actually been able to do at Point Lisa's and Port of Spain? With respect to the non-intrusive inspection, that has helped, because it's still inspection, that has helped a lot. And uh, more containers have been referred to the container examination stage. You made reference to this business of non-intrusive. Could you describe that for our benefit, please? What do you mean by that? How is it done? Well, it is the scanner. The scanner, it is a device. I mean, I may have to call on one of my members from my scanner team to give you a more detailed explanation. So it is, uses non-intrusive technology. So... Um, May I confirm, please? Sure. Thank you, Jim.
Yes, indeed. What we have are four VACIS scanners. So VACIS is a vehicle and cargo inspection system. It basically is a scanning device on a mobile platform. It's integrated into the vehicle platform. What you have is a cobalt 60 radioactive source, and you have a detector array, right? The source illuminates your target, and the idea of non-intrusive lends to the concept of there is no hands on the examination. So if customs is examining a cargo, cargo or container in our regular sense, that means we are opening the container. That means we are unstuffing the container. That means we are examining and we are looking at the contents. We all understand that this takes a particular amount of time, right? And time in business, time on the port is money, right? So the idea with non-intrusive examination is one, you reduce the overall time for examination, but two, in certain instances, you have a more efficient examination because the radioactive source is actually illuminating through the target, so you're getting a picture that looks like an X-ray, as opposed to sometimes when you are examining by eye, X-ray is actually superior. So the device gives you several advantages, sometimes a superior, a superior method of examination, faster cycle time, much more efficient. And that works for vehicles and containers. But it's vehicle and cargo, so you can examine. It's basically a, mon a multi-modal device. The, we, have, we are using it for the examination of containers. So internationally, the device can be used for other things as well. In our application, we are looking at container examination, and we are applying it in that way on the port. What about vehicles? When I spoke about special ops, the container is a mobile. How we are operating it now, it's almost like a fixed mobile. Excuse my terminology. I see what you mean, yes. But it can be moved and vehicles can be scanned. I see what you mean. Mr. Leon. I just want to go down the road and just get a little bit more clarification on the rail and the productivity or the use of the scanners so far since we have gone in. I was hearing if I was you're doing about 18 per day going through the non-intrusive scanning process, right? Um, the president mentioned that in the United States you use about a 2%. United States is a not a good example for well totally not not one that an example that I will want to use here in this particular region. In the region, Jamaica, um, some of the other regions, give me an example, give me an idea, what is the kind of percentages that we are looking at in those areas? However, as you mentioned, Jamaica has it. My understanding is that Jamaica attempts to do anywhere between 30 to 40 percent. All right, so 30 to 40 percent. I mean, and my, if I could still do my math based on what I was seeing, hearing that you basically are down right now about a little bit over 10 percent, 12, about 12 percent is what you're doing, about 12. When this is a pilot project, what was the extent, what was the plan that you were looking at to, uh, to attempt to do? Where, where, what, would, what was your original goal to get to in the pilot? Yes? yes. Well, I, I'm not sure which one. Let me, yeah, I, who, they said it was a pilot project. I'm just trying to understand when the pilot was set up, what was the intention of the volume that you were looking to aim to go? Was that the 50% that you mentioned before? We at the last hearing, I understood that the former controller had mentioned that we were examining about less than 40% containers. So with the inclusion of the mobile scanners, we were hoping that we would get our examinations up. But with the pilot, you would recall that how we operate a mobile scanner the scanner, for me, this is, should have been operating in the way where the, the containers come off the vessel and you drive your scanner. So this, the, it is scanned prior 
to going into the yard. But it cannot be done that way at this point because of the Ascuda system and the Navis system. Containers, normally, we can only um, have information on the importers when they come to clear the container with their EC82 document. That is when we are able to determine everything about the container. As a, so therefore, we were looking at what there is available to us and how we can improve what we do. That was the intent of the pilot. Right, but I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to, 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 to really, I mean, this, this canning process is, is critical. We recognize that these, and we are looking for guns. We understand that ammunition is firing in itself, but this is critical. So to me, if we are doing a pilot and we are down at, at, at 12%. I mean, we are way off. 12%, 10 minutes, 180. That's really just about three hours of actual time out of a day. I mean, um, what do we need to do to get that productivity up to a higher level? Training. We need more officers trained in the scanner, and we need more officers employed at the Customs and Excise Division. Yeah, but I, I find. Let me let me finish. All right, go ahead. Sorry. At present, we are 182 officers short, out of a total of 450. Every time we open a new section, we have to find officers. As is to start the scanner, we had to pull from various places. I tell you, we have the bare minimum to operate the scanner at Point Lisas at this time. So once somebody is scanning, another person can be reading the scan, but as is, it's the same officer going, doing everything, and it is very young. Yeah, but you know, I dare say, and I hear that, and I hear the, 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 um, the shortage, but the reality is when you do, you, you do operate the scanner we do. right now, and 18 scanners a day, 10 minutes, that's, 100 and, that's three hours in an in a eight-hour day. Um, even if with your present limited staff, you have one scanner going, I mean, the productivity or the production of going of, 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 of volume going through, it should be a higher number. I would say, but again, I point out to you that the report I got stated clearly that the major challenge continues to be the availability of the importer's trucks. So if the importer does not come and collect his container on his trailer, nothing can be brought to be scanned because the Port Authority or the Customs do not own trailers. Yeah, but again, if I want to push the point, but whatever it is, five, 584, I mean, the 500 546 containers, people are coming with their container or people are coming with their their trucks to move, they move. So even those that are there, why is the percentage still so low? Because they are coming to move their, their, their containers. Again, I might be missing the whole process. I just don't seem to understand why the productivity is there. And, and one other thing, again, we are in a pilot. So I want to get an idea. We know what we're looking for. How successful have we been in what we have done so far? I mean, I don't want to break any national security um, information yeah. okay. but I mean uh, has it been successful in actually identifying arms coming through what you have done so far in the pilot we have not identified any arms coming through but what it is it encourages I believe compliance because that is where we are heading to ensure that there is compliance and so you believe that the fact that the scanners are on and people know that we are scanning, albeit twelve percent, that is why we people that, that they are not they're not they're not they are there are no arms coming through again. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Chair, but I am not saying that. I am saying based on what I have seen, the reports I have got, 
if we have scanned 12 containers, as you see, none of the 12 showed any arms. I do have one scan that I can show you, but it is not for public viewing. So I can show you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. This is to Club Deco. <clears throat> Just to follow on from a, a question from Ms. Oliveri. Have you had any adverse impact on um, the operations of the port since the implementation of the scanners? Thus far, based on the number of containers that are being scanned, we have, had, we have not yet had an, an adverse impact. And again, as the, the controller is also saying, the, the, the critical issue really is about the speed of, of the scanning process. My, my, my observation is that I think we're still in a, a learning curve process. So as the, 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 the relevant skills are, are honed and, and improved, my belief is that the speed at which the, the, scanning, the scanning has been done could be considerably improved as well. And the number of containers that could be scanned. You're talking about also, 10 minutes or yes. an hour and a half? 10 minutes per, per container. OK, you think? Speed should be improved. It's the speed. I believe that the speed, the speed could be improved because it's um, in other in other jurisdictions where the scanning scanning is done, mm -hmm. the scanning is done is, is is actually processed in a much shorter period. But as okay. I said, it's still early days, and I believe as, as the skill base improves, the speed at which the scanning is is done okay. could be considerably reduced. I'm seeing that you have uh, you have increased um, in the number of containers authorized for delivery. Um, have there been any cost consequences or any benefits to the port? Well, the, the, num the number of containers that have been, been authorized for, for delivery is not really a, a, a factor of the scanning process, but this is simply an issue regarding respect to the trade. So the, in the, 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 early, the early part of, of the year, there were less containers passing through the port as opposed to the, the, the second Second okay, so my quarter. question really is, since the introduction of this new scanning process and, and containers will be scanned um, you know, at a faster rate, will the port, because I, I assume the port receives a benefit from the amount of containers passing through, does the, does the port receive a benefit or are there cost consequences to this new system? Well, the, 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 ben the benefit for us, and there's, there's no cost benefit to say, but the benefit for us really is, is an increased level of, of scrutiny and uh, uh, an increased level of, of security with respect to the processing of cargo. But okay. As far as a cost benefit is concerned, no. So you're saying that with the faster processing of cargo, you do not make more money? Well, c currently, no, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a, it's a faster processing of, of cargo. I mean, if, 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 if anything, it will really be a, 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 a sacrifice that will have to, be, have to be made on the part of all stakeholders. Because if, if, I, if I can explain the, the process quickly, so prior to the, prior to the, the implementation of the, the scanners, if um, a, a, for an import container, for, for instance, once the, the importer and the truck driver goes through the process, gets the required documentation and so on approved, once the container is, is, is picked up in the storage yard, the next the next stopping point would be the would be at, at the gate, at which point the the container documents will be checked by our gate personnel, by security and by and by customs. With, this, with the, the scanner the scanners in place now, there would there, there would put potentially an intermediate step before the the truck the truck with the container gets to the out gate. So if so if so, there would be a there would be a slight deviation or slight increase as far as the overall processing time from the time the, the, the truck enters the port to the time it leaves it leaves the, the port. But the, but the, 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 the ultimate benefit one is is from an increased security perspective, and, from a, and also the benefit as well as a, as, as improved screening of cargo. Additionally. The ultimate, ultimately, they are a benefit to the truck, to the trucking companies as well, because as the as the as the number of containers that are scanned increases, 
ultimately the, the expected number of continents, continents that will go to the continent examination station would decrease. And as I said before, when it goes to the examination station, it can take up, upwards, of, upwards of, of, of two hours for the overall process. And in some cases, the, the truck driver may have to wait a, a day or two for an appointment to get a continent examination station. So in terms of the overall process for trade, the continent exam the, sorry, the scanners would really improve the process overall. Okay. Um, let me ask you, have you, has the port seen a drop in the usage, that is, the importers wishing to use Plipdeco since the implementation of these scanners? No, we have not. All right. And to the controller of customs, you indicated that you all needed a greater, greater manpower to operate these scanners. What have you done in terms of uh, being proactive um, in acquiring more staff? I have reached out to the leaders, who are the owners of the scanner, well, not the owners, but the manufacturers, and they are coming in in July to do training with a group of officers I have to train, but it's, as I said, I have approached the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Finance, who has promised to give the funding. It's extremely expensive. It is not a trainee trainer. So we have to ensure that training, to ensure that it is sustainable to operate the scanners, that we are continually trained. So I have reached out, and Lidos is coming in July. And train the trainer is not an option? No. So we are looking at other options. We are going through the contract right now to see whether we can source any other um, persons to train us. But yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This question would be to um, Mr. Hewitt, I think it is. Um, in the report that you sent, that was sent from Plumdeco, sorry, they have pictures so I'm able to actually see the mobile scanner. Um, and you indicated earlier on that they're used as stationary scanners. So the scanner itself, which is the vehicle, stays in one spot, and then the driver with the container on the truck would pass under the scanner based on what I'm seeing here. No? Operation, there are two modalities. The truck can pass through the scanner, or the scanner can pass over the truck. That's, that's what I wanted to get at. So then, and now I understand what you're saying by you don't have um, beds for the containers to go on at the port, that you could actually you know, move the container through before the driver comes. Now, when we were there last year, I understood that you would have your device, and I would just call it an arm, it may not be that particular name, that takes the container off the ship, and then they would stack it in a particular location. Logistically speaking, understanding that you have mobile scanners that themselves can move, have you looked at that particular procedure, moving the container from the ship onto whatever space you have in the port in a manner that would allow you, the customs and excise at the port, to use the mobile scanner to drive um, over the containers to allow you to scan them before the driver arrives. I understand that that may require a little bit of space, but it may help in that regard. Did you look at it from that logistical standpoint? It is something we have looked at. The container, though, this, how the fastest scanner is operationalized. We cannot have the container flat on the ground. It has to be a specific height. So even if we have a two stack or three stack, the one at the bottom will not be scanned. Require you building something, but you have, all right, let me yes, ask this. You have the ability to move the containers from one spot to another on do. the port, yes? So if you, knowing that, can build a platform to allow you to move the container using the device that you have, rest it on the bed, let's just call it a bed, use your own mobile device to scan it before the driver arrives so that when they come, it's already scanned, it's either going to the CES, which is the intrusive examination, or they're taking their container because they've been cleared to move. But I'm just trying to say that logistically speaking, 
knowing what is required, you can build something to allow you to actually go through that process before the driver arrives, as opposed to waiting to the driver to come, because they have the bed, the truck bed upon which they could put the container so that you could scan it. There may be one other issue, that is the issue with the nuclear physicist and the um, radiation arm and the band and the space that is needed. I am not, I will have to go again to my team to get the rudiments of what requires with respect to the the x-rays so but I know that too is an issue as to where the scanner should be spaced should be placed and the um, the spacing that you require to ensure that other people are not exposed to any radioactive rays thank you mr. chair mr. Matthews good afternoon you said on, on two occasions that the cost of the training is very expensive. Yeah. Can you give us an idea of what the cost is to train one of your officers? Okay, I can tell you to train 12 officers, it's 88,000 US. 88,000 US? Yeah. That is for 12 officers? Yeah. That is the quote we have got. How many times in the last two and a half years have you petitioned the Ministry of Finance through the Permanent Secretary? for this $88,000 US okay. to train these officers? You would recall that the maintenance contract was only finalized in October last year. Since then, we have had one set of persons trained, and now I have sent over for another set of persons to be trained. No. In answer to Minister LeHunt, is it correct that both with respect to Point Lisas and with respect to Port of Spain, since these scanners have been implemented, there has been no instance where firearms have been found or contraband in relation to drugs? I want to expand it from drugs and firearms in any container at either port. The scanners have not been implemented at the port of Port of Spain, and as I have said previously, we have not detected anything. At point Lisa. Now, in answer to um, the member previously, you said that there is a senior um, customs and excise officer that is, makes the decision as to which containers are to be scanned and which are not to be scanned, subject to scanning, correct? Correct. Okay. It's really a, a risk management unit. Risk management unit. What I want to find out is this. If person X this container is coming in on a particular date. How do you schedule that officer who is responsible for making that decision to scan or not to scan a particular container at a particular point in time? Who makes that decision? That officer, that is his function. No, he, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm prob you're probably missing what I'm asking. Yeah, maybe the I scheduling am. of that officer for duty at the time when that container is to be scanned. How is that done? The officer works from eight to four. The ASICUDA system, we can see when an importer makes a declaration, when he pays his declaration, and when he is, has made an appointment to come and get his goods. If I am an, import, if I am an importer, Am I able to tell beforehand who is the officer scheduled? No. Why not? If I know the people in customs and excise, if I'm an importer and I'm familiar with the staff in customs and excise, is there a scheduling for the staff at customs and excise to work on particular days per month? Yes, there is, and we have rota a rotation system. Okay. So if I am working for customs and excise, I can tell on what days I will be in the risk um, um, department to, to, to scan containers. Chair, if I may, member is going into a very sensitive issue here that I can discuss after this has to do with our risk analysis and risk management. And uh, I do not think that some of these questions should be answered in 
probably. The member is interrogating the system on behalf of the parliament as a part of this committee. Um, the member is saying that, well, I understood the member to be saying in some circumstances in this world, there have been judge shopping. It is known to lawyers that they seek certain judges in order to hear matters. But this court has a system where matters are assigned to different judges in an attempt to avoid that possibility. You see? Um, the member is really saying that if it is possible that an importer could know the day and time that the particular officer is scheduled for duty, and he's implying, if I may get to it in candor, that that officer is in collaboration with that importer. It is possible he could go not judge shopping, but officer shopping. And he gets that, and the situation, because it is that officer who may decide whether to put refer to scanner or not on the container. That's what he's saying. I think that can be safely answered without really exposing matters of national security. Okay. You, what the member wants to know is what systems are in place by you to avert that possibility. Treat it from that standpoint. Okay. What we are Thank doing you. right now, we are including it into our as good a system selectivity. And yes, there is always the human element in anything. People want to do things they can. And this raises issues of integrity and integrity testing and all of that, that that's a separate matter. Mr. Ramdeen, anything further immediately? Um, um, Madam Comptroller, what is the holdback with having the scanners operationalized in Port of Spain? There is some infrastructural work that will soon, well, hopefully soon be completed. And uh, a budget has been, an estimated cost has been given. And again, the Ministry of Finance has agreed to stand and finance the infrastructural work. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, are there any, in, in relation to the question you just answered, outstanding IR issues related to the implementation of scanners in the Port of Spain? If I may recall, I believe the Public Services Association, they were part and parcel of the initial stages of the mobile scanners. The port of Port of Spain may have to answer with respect to the fixed scanner. So. so from your perspective, you don't have the information related to whether the outstanding IR issues, which were suggested by some as being the one of the critical factors in implementing the scanners in Port of Spain, which have been there since 2014, if I'm not mistaken, is not a critical issue anymore, to your information. The mobile scanners that have been here in 2014 can be implemented as soon as the infrastructure work is done. I am not aware of any further IRSCs. Okay. I want to go back to the information that was given regarding the 18 uh, containers that are scanned presently and the protocol for deciding on what is an appropriate volume, and, and I guess Mr. Taylor can also chip in here, and yourself and the customs officials. The deciding factors, according to my research, in what is an appropriate percentage for any particular jurisdiction, because the different jurisdictions have, would have different percentages that are considered appropriate, 
based on the risk profile of that jurisdiction, the volume of cargo being shipped, the type of sh cargo being shipped, the equipment uh, that is in place to scan, etc. Have all these considerations been factored in deciding what will be your target if and when the ministry funding becomes available? And then, and with, if so, what is that target? Because to me, that's the scientific way of doing it. We are hopeful that based on the pilot in Point Lisas and with continuous improvement at the end of the pilot, because we know we have had issues, that Port of Spain will be able to move much more fluently than with than Point Lisas. Yes, we do know what we intend to target because risk analysis and management is an ongoing thing. It is not only with respect to scanners. You have to remember, they not. we have been it, inspecting cargo for ever since, and our risk management is based sometimes on intel. We, again, I'm heading down a road, I should. But yes, we do know what we intend to target, and we are hopeful that our risk will be beneficial, our risk uh, management. With all due respect, Miss mm -hmm. Matthews, what is the target? You are 18 now. What is the target in six months? The target is to get to at least 40, 50. 40, 50. And that is in keeping with international best practice. Yeah. Plebdeco is 51% privately owned and 49% state owned. Other way around. The other way around. 51% government and 49% privately owned. So it is, prime, it is commercial enterprise. In the project planning for the rollout of this, was the need for 400, is it, additional staff members or trained staff, 180, sorry, staff members factored and a timeline for the, uh, the, the, the recruitment or identification of this and funding for these identified and, and possible issues in attending to those issues. Because I'm thinking if you, if you, are, if you have a, a business plan in place, you must know the factors that you're working with. And critical factors is, of course, HR, one of the critical factors, I should say. So it's surprising that that volume, or that number, sorry, because it's people we're talking about, in terms of deficit of staff exists presently. And, and, and you also mentioned 88,000 US to train 12 staff members. Uh, is there a contingency plan in terms of if you don't get the funding for 12, you will do six or four to move the process forward? Okay, in answer to question one, staff shortages at, at the customs has existed for quite a while. Because we are public servants, our staff is hired by service commission. Over the years, and it's even up to last week, we have made recommendations to the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Finance, to have the all the vacancies filled. As is, the, we all know the bureaucratic structure, the top 42 positions in customs are vacant. And this has not happened now. Could, could you repeat that, the top the, 42 positions? Of course, we are only acting in positions. No supervisors, no collectors, no assistant controllers, no deputy controller, no controller. We are all customs and excise officers, three acting in higher positions. How long has this been outstanding like that? This has been outstanding for a while. Um, the last retired controller left in 2016, but the positions have been vacant for quite a while, and unless we can move the base, which is the customs and excise officers one, most of whom are acting officers, move them up to the two level, we cannot have any intake. So you're saying that in addition to the person specifically identified for training with this 
in this scenario. There are other significant HR. We have a lot of HR issues. Issues in the customs. All right, just three quick questions before I move on. The, uh, the issue of uh, Flip Deco being uh, into, uh, ISPS certified, Mr. Taylor. And uh, according to my research, ISPS certification is an initial step in establishing low base security in global shipping. Shipping, sorry, my, my apologies. And that is primarily to do with terrorist threats and external threats, but it also has implication for internal threats. So Mr. Taylor indicated earlier on that the cost of the implementation of this system, it didn't have a cost advantage, but higher levels of certification and risk prevention does have a cost implication because you, the higher certified you are, the more possible volume of trade you can do. Is that correct? It's correct, yes. Right. Uh, how, how, uh, how much has this ISPS certification helped the, the uh, Clip Deco plant in terms of generating new business and volume? Well, it would be hard, hard for me to, to say specifically whether the ISPS has helped, because remember that we would have put a number of different measures in place over the years to increase our market share. So improving security would, would have been only one of the many measures that, that we would have, would have put in place. So while we, have, while we would have increased our ma market share pretty substantially over the years to the point where we probably have about 54 to 55% of, of the domestic cargo, it's hard for me to say whether it's because of improved security or as opposed to improved efficiency improved, or improved productivity. Oh. Mr. Uh, Birch, uh, and I guess you, you, your remit is security. When 12% of containers are searched and there has been no identification of arms, is that a red flag for you that some, something in the process may be amiss? Or is it that we're just that good? No, it doesn't raise a, a, a red flag per se. Um, customs has the responsibility to examine cargo. Uh, the port security is to ensure that cargo entrusted in its care, whilst it's in, ex, coming for export or going out as import, uh, remain secured, that they are not tampered with. Oh, understood. So now I'll pose this question to customs. Does 12 percent, a 12 percent search volume with no identification, is that of concern to anyone? With the non-intrusive inspection, yes, it is a concern. But what I would say over the, with physical inspections and not with respect to containers, but with respect to the barrels, we have been able to identify drugs as up to yesterday. So I do not know if there may be another way of trying to import other than containers, but I can tell you that. Right, final question in this round. The, and this is to the, I guess, Ms. Ms. Matthews, in addition to the uh, customs uh, officials, you, and following Member Ramdeen's question earlier on about the, I guess, suggesting about the possible predictability of rostering and, and its uh, possible correlation to uh, malfeasant persons or persons who may be engaged in corruption. One of the, the concerning aspects of our visit to me at the port of Port of Spain was, maybe I just didn't understand, the inability of the officials of customs to identify a process by which containers are actually identified for searching. I think the term used was the grinder. 
Yes. Am I wrong? All right. The term was a grinder. Yeah. And the grinder seemed to be a combination of uh, risk management assessment, personal experience and qualifications, history of the importer, et al. Which to me screamed of a possible lack of understanding, because most of the research I've seen mandates a rotation of critical staff in ports to avoid just that, in addition to the implementation of what is described as a randomization algorithm that is programmed and reprogrammed regularly to take as much of the human element out. And I don't get that that is the process or the procedure being undertaken here. I get that it is still highly dependent on a certain group of people, which puts the process at risk for corruption. And I stress at risk for corruption. So I'm wondering why haven't we gone the route of what seems to be best practice in randomized algorithms for identification of cargo to be searched to eliminate a scenario where persons who are in any position for an extended length of time are vulnerable and subject to corruption and corrupt practices. But um, there is random selection. By whom? The Asguda system. When Please, please do. Because the grinder wasn't identified as the Asikuda system to us when we visited. The grinder seemed to be personnel. So you can confer wholesomely. Okay. Mr. Um, Hewitt will take the question. Mr. Hewitt, please elucidate us. Um, we're going to try to explain the difference between some of the systems we have. Now, I'm the collector of valuations, right? That is the department that's entrusted with trying to determine that the values presented to us for imports are accurate. When you submit an entry, you submit your, your documentation to customs, which is done in electronic format, we randomize that for, officer, for officer's check. So that, that, that system is totally randomized. So the system itself determines which officer will take a look at which entry. No, there's no human interference in that. So that system was put into, put into place to address. Just to interject. And it randomizes which officer will look at each document. document. Yes. Is it a closed number of officers being rotated? And how long have those officers been in that position? We have, being randomized, we being have, supposedly randomized. Now, Customs rotate, rotates with officers for various stations. So all officers are rotated from a four-month period to a six-month period, in some cases, a nine-month period. But every job in Customs, all of those examination jobs, officers are regularly rotated. That is, that is a, a process that we have that structures regularly. So in this sense, in the evaluation section, for example, we rotate officers even in the section in and out. So it's difficult for an importer to predict, really difficult. That, that's an international class system. And it was brought in to improve our transparency as it regards that particular circumstance. And to allow us to have a platform where we could stand and say that we believe that we are operating a transparent system and we have done the best that we can do to assure the public, ensure the government that officers and um, importers are not in collusion. No. When we look at risk assessment, we have challenges with randomization. Risk assessment calls for a particular kind of knowledge. Now, the training that we've got for risk assessment has come from UNCTAD. UNCTAD is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and the officers who work in that section are fairly highly trained, but it is a difficult tool to make into a program. 
it is something that, re that requires human in in interaction. The intel feeding and other things that feed into it require people. Now, again, we rotate those sections as well. And it's more than one person in a section. And because we are using the ASICUDA system, we have people over those people who are also checking what they do to ensure that they are complying with the rules and the rule set that the division has set. A question to Ms. Matthews, including this set of questions. Uh, is your petition to the Permanent Secretary, or does your position, petition, sorry, to the Permanent Secretary include funding for technology? Because in reference to the Port of Port of Spain, that digital footprint in many circumstances is abysmal. Uh, they are, there's a, a dearth of CCTV cameras, in addition to which in 20, when did we revisit? 17? 2017, the documentation process for vehicles was a clipboard with two individuals writing car registration numbers in Port of Spain. And I found that particularly disturbing. And has that changed? Because it is very easy for me to write a list today and change it tomorrow. Not to mention the security provisions at that area were also extremely substandard, in my opinion. The estimates do include CCTV. Perhaps either Ms. Matthews or Ms. Shepard can answer this. This LIDOS program that is being used to scan these containers, is this an international um, standard program um, for scanning of containers? LIDOS is the provider of the program. Yes, they are the provider of the systems. Right. No, what I, why I'm asking that, it's a precursor to me asking you. When the government spends this 88,000 US to train these people, and to use your words, it's very expensive, what, um, what is put in place by Customs and Excise to ensure that the training that is invested in these officers who benefit from this training um, don't leave the Customs and Excise and go anywhere else and work um, in a similar position? Well, I would hope that the officers do not leave. We do not have a history of officers leaving other than by retirement or death. And um, once officers are trained, they are assigned to the scanner unit. Just, just to satisfy that, uh, you know, the customs is, is a highly reputed, well-paid uh, unit of the Ministry of Finance, and they, they, they seldom leave. It's a very... It's a very, it's an area that attracts a lot of competition. Yes. Um, Member Oliver. Thank you very much. Um, just for the benefit of the generally listening public, let me just get into the technology of the scanners that we have. You indicated that it's um, Cobalt 60 scanners. All right, so these scanners primarily just look for nuclear material and weapons. Is that correct? No, this, this source is a radioactive source. With scanning technology, there are several types of scanning technology, and you tend to get either radioactive or X-ray. With an X-ray, your scanning begins when you switch on the system and you power it up. A radioactive source is inherently always on. So it's just that the source enclosure opens. So that is just the means by which you perform the, the, exa the examination. But the device is going to give you, if you think of it as an X-ray type device, it's going to give you penetration for a whole host and many different types of cargo. So it's not strictly for radiation per se. When we, when we deploy the device, in addition to weapons, which you know, is a major priority for the division, we're also looking to see if we can determine drugs. We're looking to see if we can determine various forms of contraband. Officers are also looking for duty evasion, so if you 
penetrator container and there's supposed to be 18 rows of steel wire rope and there are 25, you know what you have to do. So it's not strictly for weaponry, it's contraband as well as duty vision. So the specific scanners that we have search both for weapons and they have x-ray as well. So you, are, so you would be able to identify drugs. In, but I'm, I'm speaking specifically about the ones that we have implemented at Plebdeca. Yes, well, you have to, re to remember a scanner, like any device, is a tool, right? That requires a highly motivated, well-trained individual, right? So scanning is not only a function of having a vacuous machine, it's also a function of having very well-trained in individuals. And that type of training is, is one thing, but to under, understand it and, and, and do it well in, is, in a sense, a, special, a specialty. No, I recognize that. I'm just trying to identify what particular model of this specific tool that we have. So the scanners that we have, they can detect both yes, they can. drugs yes. and, and, um, and well, radioactive sources and weapons as well. With, in combination with the knowledge of the, of the, of the individual, they, they, actually, they go together. <laughs> they, one, one can't be separated from the, from the other, really. Um, no, I'm, I'm just trying to identify exactly what capability exists in the yeah, equipment that we have yes. procured. So I think you've said that we have the full range of capabilities. Now it's just up to the limitations now of the technicians implementing it. Now, yeah. what I would also like to inquire about is, now the... Scanners have not yet been implemented at the Port of Port of Spain. The controller indicated that there is some infrastructure work that's outstanding. Who's responsible for completing that infrastructure work? The Port of Port of Spain, but the funding has been provided by the Ministry of Finance. Okay, can I ask the Port of Port of Spain um, just for some indication of a timeline as to what's the progress of the work that is being done? If it's where are we in? having that work executed. Chairman, if I may. <clears throat> the, the two sets of scanners for Port of Spain. The fixed scanner is basically ready for operation. Uh, by that I mean it's physically it's ready. The outstanding issue there was a contract that was supposed to be uh, signed. I think yesterday that was returned to the Ministry of Works. So I expect that that should be signed any time anytime now. And once that is done, it can be handed over to the customs for operation. So that's available. The mobile scanners, on the other hand, that is one that is, uh, we still have some infrastructural work outstanding on that. And that's dependent on the availability of the funds to, to effect those, um, that infrastructure work. Could you give an indication of um, the quantum of funds? And I mean, is, is everything in place? Have you all identified? You've done an estimate. You have everything waiting. Are you just waiting for the Ministry of Finance to cut a check for the work to be done? The fund, the, the estimate that was provided for the work was five point one million dollars to enable the. Uh, to bring the mobile scanners on stream. On stream. Uh, that was um, forwarded to the, to the customs, and there's some revision, I think, with that number. There was a review of the cost by PO, uh, so that's still to be determined, but as soon as that is completed, and the, the, the final decision is made in terms of what uh, will be installed and con constructed, will be, that work will be done. If I may ask Sir Plip Deco, what was involved at your location for you to start um, to use in the mobile scanners? What type of infrastructure work did you have to do and what was the cost? Okay, the infrastructure work included the, the preparation of two areas, one for import, one for, one for export, and having those two separate areas paved, fenced around, installation of CCTV cameras, as well as providing accommodation for the truckers at both locations, implementation or construction of um, provision of custom offices for customs, as well as a wireless system. What approximate cost for all of that? 
about $2 million. I would like to ask, in respect of Point Lisas, for the past year, about how many incidents of the presence or the confiscation or the seizure, the finding of drugs or ammunition can you report about here today? And I would like to hear the same for Port of Spain. Because I read recently that you found some marijuana on the port, I think about three weeks ago or so, I, you, I read in the paper that you all found that. And it's a long time I didn't read that. So I would like to get a sense of, for the past year, for the benefit of this committee, I know you may not have the details in front of you, but about how many incidents did we have on record of finding guns and or drugs at each of your ports? Starting with you, Mr. Taylor. From what I recall, there may have been one incident at the, the warehouse where drugs may have been found, from my recollection. In the past year? In the past year. Mr. Alexander, I know you are new, a brand new chairman of the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, but I do know you would have come here sufficiently briefed to be able to answer that question. Or if you do not, you can provide us with that in writing. I will ask Mr. Birch, who may be in a better position. Chairman. Yes, he's been there for a long time. Yes, Mr. Birch. Chair, over the last year, we would have had several interdictions for marijuana um, at the ferry terminals based in both in Scarborough and Port of Spain. No, no, I'm sorry. And no, I'm not, I'm not talking about the... At the cargo in, in, at Shenzhen, yeah. the, we would have had a number of seizures for narcotics based on my information. Yeah. Um, we have not had seizures based on firearms. But I how think. many incidents, seizures of marijuana, you would, of drugs, you would say over the last we, year, roughly? Roughly around five incidents. About five? Yes. Now, you know, the answer to those questions are very, that question put to both ports is very interesting for me because, you know, the, some of us wear different hats and we get the impression that a lot that is happening is happening at and through our legal ports of entry. There's a perception that a lot of the guns, and they are very, very prevalent in Trinidad and Tobago. I want to give one example just to demonstrate how prevalent. A citizen was robbed about three weeks ago in the city. And he reported that the four persons who robbed him, not only they all looked like 17 years and down, but every one of them had a firearm, which was displayed. That alone, along with other statistics, like the police recovering 1,064 last year, and the daily occurrences of murders and robberies and shootings that we have come, unfortunately, to cope with, you get a sense, even as an observer, anecdotally, that there are a tremendous amount of illegal firearms on the streets around there. So when I ask those two questions, and I juxtapose that against the fact that the police are saying, intelligence reports are reflecting that our legal ports are a major stage and post for importation in containers, in fridges, in stoves, in used cars, in parts, imported of parts, to hear that we are one at Point Lisas for the past year, roughly, or five in Port of Spain, it is not very, very encouraging to me as a citizen with access to you here today. I feel, and we decided we'll put the scanners in, well, we are now aware that Port of Spain is not up and running as yet. When we were down there last, we saw the apparatus in place 
the scanning area, an enclosed area. The vehicle were driving there with the container. It will take about three minutes, they told us, for the thing to be scanned. The operators in a room way away from radiation exposure to where it is being scanned, shielded. And they just do the business on the computer. The thing gets scanned, the reports come up, and the vehicle goes. This question of radiation was not an issue based on what we saw. But of course, radiation is involved, personnel is involved, and that became a big matter for great discussion. I see here in the Flip Deco submission that a radiation safety committee has been established. Am I correct, Mr. Taylor? And it is to continue to review this to make sure that whatever systems you have in place are safe. But the key point I want to make before I come back to Mr. Alexander, as regards Port of Spain, I want to know precisely why we are not yet. What is the problem? What is the obstacle from causing us not to have implemented the fixed scanner as I saw with these eyes in place on the port when we went there roughly a year ago? Could you tell us? Chairman. The, as I said, the physical infrastructure is ready. The scanners are ready for operation. As far as I'm aware, training was done for 45 customs officers to do that. What uh, has prevented anything else from happening was the a sig a signature, really, or the signing of, of the a contract, a maintenance contract. Uh, that is the document that, I was, as a matter of fact, just before coming here, I saw uh, an email regarding that that uh, contract that spoke about um, that, that may, I think there may be two or three other items that need to be corrected or agreed upon before that signature is, um, or that agreement is closed so that the training can, the, the operation can begin. So from the Port of Port of Spain's perspective, uh, the equipment is ready for operation. Just the maintenance of that contract is where the problem is. Not custom in excess. No. Matter that this committee will bring to the attention of those who must hear that because it is very, very, very remarkably sad. Remarkably sad. Mr. De Freitas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when we visited the port of Port of Spain last year, we were told that the only problem that prevented those scanners from turning on was sign off by the PSA. That's, that's what we were told. That's the only thing that was left. And I think there was an interview with the president of the PSA at the time who made comments in relation to that. Has that been resolved? I will ask uh, Mr. Gonzalez to, to speak to that. Mr. Chairman, yes, the situation with the PSA, that has been resolved. And also, with regard to all the stakeholders involved, we have... Um, concurrence by all to move forward with the scanner. Okay. And in, just to piggyback off the comments made by the chairman, where he's absolutely correct in that, based on information on the joint, coming to the Joint Select Committee on National Security, I just want to ask two questions. Does the Customs and Excise Division in any way interact with the TTPS, specifically with or in regards to information by way of the amount of guns and drugs that are on the streets, and I'm, I'm asking that question in a lead up to another question, but I just want to find that out. Yes, we do have regular meetings with the Commissioner of Police and other heads of security. So based on what the Chairman has said, where there is a pervasiveness in Trinidad and Tobago in relation to the amount of guns and the amount of drugs, does the Customs and Excise Division, do you all believe that guns and drugs are coming through the, the, the legal ports in Trinidad and Tobago? Is that a belief that you all have? We believe that drugs are coming in maybe via mostly the legal ports and maybe via the legal ports. 
but you don't believe that there's any guns coming in. You said drugs, but not guns. I said guns and drugs. Guns and drugs, okay. Sorry, Madam Comptroller. Um, I just heard from Mr. Alexander that there have been 45 officers from Customs and Excise who have been trained to use the scanning system. Why are those officers not being um, used at the Point Leasters to, to supplement the officers that you said there's sh shortage at Point Leasters with respect to these officers? One, I am not aware that 45 officers have been trained, and two, the technology is different. Uh, that, that poses a real problem, because how many officers do you envisage would be needed to implement, in terms of customs and excise, the system at Port of Spain? Minimum for the mobile scanner is five, and for the fixed scanner, about seven. Okay, and are you sat have you been um, given that um, um, number of staff? Have those persons been trained um, in the expectation that the system at Port Spain is going to come on board? I believe in my, up to this morning we had a meeting, and I believe there is scanning for the fixed scanner, scanner training that has been um, set by NOCTEC, which is the responsibility again of the Port of Port of Spain. I, maybe Mr. Gonzalez may be able to expound on this. Sorry, thank you very much. When we toured your facility on the 14th of July, 2017, that's roughly a year ago, we, this committee, identified and noted a number of things. And we will give you a copy of this list, but I want to, for the purpose of the current discussion, highlight a few of them. We noted that in the area of Shed 4, along Quayside, passing through the container terminal, we noticed a virtual absence of a comprehensive CCTV camera coverage of that area. Is that still the case today? Mr. Birch Mr. might one, know. One, one, one. Yes. Yeah, my understanding, uh, Chairman, is that that condition still exists. However, this was a matter that came up just this week uh, for, uh, for approval to install a CCTV system on the port. We found that there was no search of vehicles at the port of embarkation. In other words, we were not able to say that the used vehicles, the foreign used vehicles coming in here, were thoroughly searched on embarkation abroad before they came here. You know, um, I don't know if it's the Essicuda system or the, um, the, the, the early, um, you know, the, the, the system that we implemented where you get information, advanced information on passengers. We were not in a position to say whether these vehicles were searched from the port of embarkation. Are we in a better position now? I would defer to Customs on that matter. Yes, Chairman. indeed. Madam Customs, Comptroller? We are not in a better position to state that they are searched when they are put on board. We found as well that... There was a rather cursory search of the bonnet, the trunk, and a glance at the interior of vehicles that were purchased, foreign used vehicles, when they were leaving the port of Port of Spain. We actually went and we saw, they described to us how they searched these vehicles. So without information that they were thoroughly searched abroad, if these vehicles are not scanned, in our port, and when they are leaving the port, it's only a very cursory search. 
without the use of canines, then there are a host of adverse possibilities in terms of importation of drugs and guns in respect of those vehicles. Has that cursory searching scenario been improved since then? Again, the non-intrusive inspection has not been introduced into Port of Spain. But at a site visit on the port, I spoke to when we were there with members of the um, port, we saw that the fixed scanner was ideal for driving these cars through after hours to ensure that there is no contraband within these vehicles. But that is not actually being done as we speak? Because the fixed scanner is not yet operational. We found that member... I'm sorry, Mr. But, uh, just Richards. sorry to interrupt, Chairman. Please, please, no, not at all. But in the absence of the vehicles being scanned with the fixed scanners, after your walkthrough, did you not find the, the level of search, or did you find the level of search that you may have witnessed adequate of those vehicles, even by human senses? Again what the tools that we have are just our hands, the human tools. We have not been provided with any other um, tool that could probably scan under the vehicle, maybe, you know, what they have in licensing that you could get below the vehicle. We do not have those facilities, but it is a work in progress and it is something we are looking at. Ma Madam Matthews, with all due respect, I think God is wonderful and he's provided us with quite great tools if we use them adequately. So do I. And my, my estimation of the use of God's provided tools was woefully inadequate by those searching those cars, even in the absence of mechanical tools. I don't know if you share that view, if you were satisfied with how the God-given tools, senses were being used <coughs> in a view to providing a better level of scrutiny on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Compound that, just to, just to say, Madam, Madam Comptroller and, and, and Mr. Chairman of the Port of Port of Spain, to compound that, vehicles have been, from the information we got, made or known to stay there as they are ready to leave before the curse research of which I spoke for as much as seven to ten days. And staff at the port had easy and free access to these vehicles during that period, the time they were on site. So you see how critical that mobile scanner is in these circumstances. Very, very critical. We found as well that, as I said, canines are not routinely used. And we found then that there had been no significant findings of drugs or guns or other contraband in these vehicles. We have composed lists here about the spectrum area, continues, the container examination section, and of course, the container scanning hall and CARICOM wharves. We have it all documented. I am prepared to share with the leave of my colleagues this list with you because you will be before us again. And the reason, one of the reasons why you will be before us again is because this committee has promised the, the larger parliament and the people of this country that we will stay on top of this matter until we are satisfied that proper best practice arrangements are in place to protect the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. As it now stands clearly from this discussion today, it is far from that. For whatever reasons, for whatever reasons, it is very, very far from that. For whatever reasons, the system feels very vulnerable, starting with the point made by Member Ramdeen. It feels very, very vulnerable. And for my own part, I don't know 
I cannot sense. Maybe you are good at disguising it as professionals, but I'm not getting a sense of the kind of passion, urgency, or even fear that ought to engulf ordinary and reasonable citizens in the circumstances in which we are put in this country today with the mayhem that is taking place out there, with the murders on a daily basis. I don't know if we are in a position to say we have done our best. Madam Comptroller, before I give way to one of my other colleagues, Mr. Ramdeen, uh, do, you, do, 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 do you concur? Would you say that the customs... Oh, and by the way, you did make several mentions of shortage of staff, but there's another side to that. The question is whether you are getting optimum production and energy and effort from those that now exist. We seldom hear of that, you know. But that's another matter. Mr. Ramdeen. We'll be just following from the comments of um, the chair, um, Ms. Matthews. I would just want to ask, we've examined, we've asked a lot of questions this afternoon about the scanning. That is one aspect of the way in which customs um, carries out its, its duty to ensure that there is no contraband, arms, drugs, and these things. I just want to ask a general question because at some point in time, we're going to have the customs and excise back before this committee, which is this. Apart from the scanning, from your vast experience, you've been in the system for a number of years. What are the other things that are needed at the moment that can increase the ability of customs to perform its duty to pick up on the, on the contraband that enters the country, the arms and ammunition that one has said on a number of occasions that many people have said in the public domain comes through the legal borders. What is it that you all need at the moment, you're speaking as the acting controller of customs, to improve it? We've heard you said staff. I want, to take, I want you to take your time and tell us so that we have a shopping list of what are the things that you need as, as you recognize now. One of the most important things we need is training. Training. Training, because what has happened is customs modernization has gone one way. Customs, some of the laws within, we would need some legislative changes. Some of the laws we work with do not conform with the trade facilitation modernization that is required of the customs. We would also like some, we would have asked for smaller scanners, barcode scanners, scanners at other ports of entry. And basically, um, we would do our best. I, as the controller, I have taken a zero tolerance for indiscipline and corruption. Anything that has come before me within my short tenure as controller, I have dealt with it and I intend to ensure that the customs that we can give to the country the maximum that it desires from us, that we Secure borders, yes, I know we have a dual role. We protect the, both the revenue and we secure the borders. And I give my firm affirmation here today that we will do our best to secure our borders. All right. um, Madam Comptroller, I just want to um, just drill a little bit deeper into the first requirement that you said. You said that the first thing that you need is training, and one understands that in every organization, as the roles change over time, and as those persons who want to break the law become more modern, you yourself need to become more modern as an organization. What are the opportunities that are currently available? Uh, the first thing is, what are the opportunities that are currently available for customs officers to advance their training, if any is available, and what are the modes of training that you require that, that, that you have identified here as being a shortage at the, at the moment? Okay, well, what I have looked at recently is marine training. We recently, last week, acquired five new dogs, so we need canine training. 
we need further risk and um, risk management, risk analysis training, training in weapon detection, drug detection, um, maybe kits training in, in that. Ma'am Comptro, I'm very grateful to you for that. Part of our mandate is to assist you in being able to carry out your function. We would like you to make available to this committee at the soonest the requests that you have made so that we can treat with it in order to assist you. So you were outlining a moment ago the number of things that you made requests for. We would like to have access to that so we can play our role as a committee in pushing that to your benefit, to the country's benefit. In addition to that, you did mention, you did mention the need for amendments to the Customs Act. I hope that you have already submitted the deficiencies as you have identified them with proposals for amendment to the permanent secretary of the ministry who would convey it to the minister who will get it to the office of the attorney general. Has that been done? Not totally. We... All right. And until that is done, the ball is still well in your court. So in respect of the amendments to the law, it is your business to say to your minister through your peers that we have identified as we implement and practice this regime certain deficiencies. And these are the, these deficiencies, and we would like some amendments. It is up to the lawyers to put it in legalese. And I look forward to that list, so we'll roll from there. Mr. Lehunt, and then, of course, Mr. DeFreitas. You know, when the chairman was reading out on the list and he was identifying certain things that came out of the site visit that they attended to, it dawned on me, I mean, having come from a banking environment, that when I look at it, it just seems, you know, in the bank we'll have these system audits. You'll have someone who will look at the system on a regular basis to identify that, well, okay, we are checking and we are all areas of weaknesses that are being enhanced on a daily, on a, on a regular basis. Um, is there some a similar process, a process that you all have within the, 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 the audit department or the controller department to ensure that, that you are, are looking at all the required areas, all the necessary weak points that are available for these things for, for because the detection rate is what we're trying to improve. Um, do you have such a thing like that, or, or have, has one been done recently? Um, is it a regular process? What I would say is, right now we have two process mapping exercises going on, mm -hmm. which will inform that. Yeah, that's it. And um, yes, audit. Supervisors, collectors, assistant controllers do pay visits. We have our stakeholders who would provide us with complaints from time to time, which we do continuous checks and balances. I want to push a little bit on that system audit, that process audit that you, is that being done internally? Is it being done externally by, by another group? And when will it be, when is it expected to be completed? Sorry, there are three things going on. We have two outside groups, and we do have, because we have teams, and uh, we are, well, they are the ones, the internal group. We have, like, project teams. Project teams internally. Yeah. I, I do want to commend you. I think, I mean, I heard a little bit of passion when you were just speaking and you talk about your zero tolerance for, for, for corruption and your zero tolerance for, for slacking times and so forth. So I, I really did see a little bit of passion in that commitment. So I want to acknowledge that and I want to continue to encourage you to along that road because we really, that is really, this is, 
this is very serious because, I mean, the ports and the porousness of our ports and the work of the Customs Department is critical um, in fighting this whole crime issue. You know, it's not just about the policing. It's really about every aspect, right, that we, we have to, to be vigilant about if we are really going to combat this issue. So I really want to commend you for that degree of passion that I'm seeing in that area. And I want to urge you to push on with these system audits as fast as possible. When are they expected to be completed? The process mapping exercise that is being done by one outside group is almost complete. My internal groups, what we do, we identify problems and issues that we have. And we sort of set up timelines within which to get it done. We make site visits and we audit. So, so far we have done about two. And well, as I again would state, the, we are stretched for staff. It is the, basically most of the project teams. We have at least one or two or three persons who are on all the various project teams. So it is a lot, but we are really, really trying and we expect to have some results by the end of the financial year. Well, you know, you know what we are very common with, we are very, just one last one. One thing that we are very good at in Trinidad is, is, is doing a lot of analysis and doing a lot of, of, um, of research. Of, of research. Um, as we have seen with regard to the scanners, I hope that is not an example. I mean, these things are outstanding there for so long. And therefore, I really want to make sure that after, especially the external um, system audits are being done and you get the results, which I'm sure you are paying for, that we really move towards dealing with the red items, the critical, and then we go through and we, 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 we systematically move towards implementing the change that is required and really improving on the weak areas because it is critical. I'm, I was frightened by some of the things that was mentioned um, by just the team when they observed, you know, and, and to know that all oh, that happened a while now and some of these things are still, 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 they're still there, so the area seems porous. Yes, so thank you, observation. And then just to frighten you a little more, in terms of the CARICOM wars, the committee has well noted an absence, that is, that is down the CARICOM GRT uh, in the Sea Lots area. The committee noted the absence of CCTV cameras. The committee was informed that most successes for finding contraband had been at that location. It's a very loose arrangement from our observation down there, very loose. Though up to that time, no firearms were found. The committee observed that many small vessels enter and leave unmonitored. They just come and go. Some of the well-to-do residents from that community had boats themselves. Moored regularly in that area. Mr. Birch was present. He knows. He knows. And that most of all, most alarming, the fencing around the area was just eight feet high. Ten-year-old can easily skip over. That area was frighteningly insecure. So you spoke about our being able to do analysis. I'm not even so sure if we do that properly. But there we go. Mr. DeFreitas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's really just to piggyback once again on, on the statements that you've just made because I noticed when, when asked what else could be done, and as much as human resource, as you've indicated, is critical, and as much as the training is to be commended as well, and the system audits is also to be commended, I wanted to, um, to focus a little bit on the infrastructural, as the chairman is saying, because when we visited that area in Port of Spain where you keep the cars, it was really, um, it was really not secure. In, in that regard, because I had asked the question of one of the individuals there, and they said there are instances where cars have gone missing. And they also indicated that cars do remain unlocked from time to time. But what we also noticed was that um, the coastline is also right there, and anybody with a prerogative could pull up, access any of the cars that are 
conveniently unlocked and access anything that may be in those cars that were not found or because of this system that's not yet implemented, they could access the contraband or whatnot. So in terms of the human resources and the training also add weaknesses in infrastructure outside of the CCTV cameras and the ability to use technology to help beef up the security. Just wanted to make that statement in relation to your you know, thoughts as to what is to be needed. Invite Mr. Taylor as president of Plip Deco to make any closing comments for the benefit of this committee as we approach conclusion. Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of, of the, the committee. And um, just wish to thank you for giving us the, the opportunity to provide an update on the implementation of the scanners at the port of Point Lisas. Um, we do hope that our responses have provided the required clarification, provided the required information that you would have expected, and we give the assurance that we will continue to work diligently along with Customs and Excise to improving the level of security at the port and then further enhance the operations there with the ultimate aim of reducing crime in the country. Thank you very much. I trust you spoke on behalf of Mr. Atheli, your chairman, who sat quietly all day. I, I thank you both. That's very strange. Yes, yeah, very unusual. Very unusual for Mr. Yes. Atheli. I, myself, I... Mr. Alexander, as chairman of the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, a former senior officer of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force with security in every sinew in your body, would you make your closing comments, please? Thank you, Chairman. The Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago thanks the committee for the opportunity to provide this update. And we commit to continue to work with the Customs and Excise Department to ensure that the scanners in, at Port of Spain are operationalized as soon as possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Comptroller. Thank you, Chair. The Customs and Excise Division thanks you for this opportunity. This committee has raised a lot of issues into the foreground that will have the customs more proactive. We, too, have been allowed to raise issues that have been plaguing us for a while. We, you have our commitment for stronger border security and to work with both the Port of Point Lisas and Port of Spain to ensure that if the weapons are coming through the legal ports, that they will be found and perpetrators brought to justice. Thank you. Last Sunday, I listened to a program on I-95 where a young woman transported drugs from Trinidad into Heathrow Airport, and she managed her way through our, in her exit, our system, she managed her way through their disembarkation procedure. She got through immigration, she got through customs, she's actually come out, and she was now in the car park at the airport. When the person who came to pick up one of the drug ring that she had belonged to, accidentally, bounced a bag belonging to another passenger just crossing a footwalk. That attracted the attention of mobile and patrolling customs officers. They intervened, and she was arrested. Sadly for her, but happily for the world. The vulnerabilities that exist in your systems at your ports really are frightening to us because vulnerability for criminal, ordinary criminal purposes, drug trafficking and gun running, are also vulnerabilities that are exacerbated for 
terrorists, and we are dealing with terrorism today. So any weaknesses in your system is a vulnerability for terrorists who will have a completely different agenda that can be more severely devastating. Recently, as I conclude, a young man, in running for his life from a gang that he had belonged to, jumped the wall of the Piaco airport and got in close enough to a plane. When the facts were revealed, it turned out that he was running for his life, but the reality is the vulnerability that he was able to experience or enjoy in saving his life revealed a severe vulnerability for those who are concerned about preventing terrorist incidents. This is a crisis we are dealing with, and you all are paid handsomely, some of you more handsomely than me, and sworn to protect this country we thank you for your commitment. We thank you for your presence here today. We felt, I share my Mr. Lehan's sentiment, we felt some passion and sincerity and truth in your declarations, Madam Comptroller. And we really rely upon them for your and our safety as citizens of this republic. We would like to thank you all for coming. And we urge you to go safely back to your respective workstations until we meet again. Thank you very much. This meeting, public hearing, is now at an end.